Well, not exactly horror. The Crow City of Angels appealed to my dark, goth, horror-loving heart back in the day, and still does to this day. The 1990s were a period filled with horror and cool films, sometimes films that were both. See this? This is my boomstick! These days, a lot of people are more into the aesthetics than the content when it comes to art, film included. And The Crow, City of Angels, is all aesthetics and a little bit of a dark story that calls to the heart of fans of the original and a few others who stumbled upon it. Nice hearing from you, Carlos! Let's start with the obvious here. This movie is not beloved, not by most and not by far. Even our own boss man, Burge Garabedian, seems to absolutely hate it. Who the f are you? Does the corpse have a familiar face? For me, it was love back when I first saw it, and now it's more nostalgia love, if anything. Yes, there is plenty left to love here, but there are also issues. Early on, I would have given The Crow City of Angels a solid 10 out of 10, but my 15-year-old brain was not as filled with movies and movie knowledge as it is today. Now, at 42, I look at it more as a 7 out of 10, but with still a lot of love for the film. Look at me. No. No. We can't do this. What's the film about? Well, it's a similar story as the first in that a man comes back from the dead to put the wrong things right. However, this installment in the series takes a different approach by having our lead be a single father whose son saw a crime being committed, this leading to the gang execution of both son and father. This is where the film is different, giving the viewers a story where the love is not a romantic one, something that may have contributed to the film's downfall. They did try to connect it to the first film by otherwise keeping the same formula with a top bad guy with his gang of underlings doing his dirty work, a man coming back to right wrongs, a child who needs help, and some of the same setups within specific scenes and sequences. He left a sign, didn't he? I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. You've seen it. You've been marked. The change from a lover to a father coming back from the dead opened up room for a love interest, something Hollywood loves to put into everything, and here, the love interest is the direct connection with the first film, bringing back Sarah as an adult, as the oracle of sorts who sees what is about to happen and goes into it head first for the sake of the lead Ash. Of course, she becomes the potential love interest, but it's not a romance, so things don't go easy and don't end up in the hallmark romance manner. This isn't real. None of this is real. As a teenager, I was in love with The Crow. It meant a lot to me, and it had a huge impact on me. So the sequel was something I was awaiting impatiently and wanted to see so badly. Only one problem. It garnered a 16 plus rating in Quebec, where I lived back then, and well, a 16 plus there is not quite like an R rating in the US. In the US, if a film is rated R, you can go see it before you're 16 if your parents or legal guardian is with you. It's not something that is all that well controlled in most theaters, so it's pretty easy to go see a film while under the required age. Especially now with the 20-something screen theaters where you could easily get a ticket for one movie and walk into any screening room. However, in Quebec, a 16 plus rating means that you cannot get in if you're under the age required. This can't be happening. We have to see this movie, dude. Ah, oh, screw it. It probably isn't all that good anyway. So a 15 and a half years old bringing all of your ancestors with you for approval and you still won't get in. Also, the film was playing in small theaters with just a few screens or even just one screen, so screen hopping was not going to be possible. Thus, this became an adventure to try and go see the film. Research was done as to where it was playing and which of those theaters were a bit more lax in their ID policy. And myself and three friends under the age of 16, we found the perfect theater, this usually empty spot with only a couple screens located in a basement of an office building. The University 2020 Theater was going to have to be it. We picked a day where most people would not be around and would not want to be at work, giving us a minimally staffed theater where the ticket seller didn't want to be at work. You see, the film was released on August 30th, 1996, which meant that the following Monday was going to be Labor Day, and in Montreal, that's your last weekend to really go out and enjoy the summer weather before school is in full swing and temperatures start dropping drastically. We all met at the metro station, headed downtown, found the theater in the lower level of the building, and made our way to the ticket booth. Goodness, we were nervous. We had two 15-year-olds who could pass for 16 easily, and two 14-year-olds who couldn't possibly. And we got in. It was shocking to even us. We went directly to the screening room and hid in its darkness. We couldn't believe it, but didn't want to celebrate it too much. The oldest one of us went and got some popcorn, and we just sat there, eagerly awaiting the film start. 
Then we saw the movie and of course we loved it. Granted, part of the love was definitely the fact we had broken the rules and had not been caught. As teens, all four of us were considered good girls and this was definitely not a good girl thing to do. Dude, that movie was sweet. It bet you yes it was. Dude, I wanna be just like Terrence and Phillip. Hey, wait a minute, where's your guardian? Huh? I knew it! You paid a homeless guy to get you in, didn't you? Following this, I picked up the film on VHS when it came out on home video. Something much easier as I was then 16 years old and could prove it when picking up the tape at HMV. I loved it still as I watched it regularly. These days, I look at the film in a more critical manner. With over 20 years of experience as a film reviewer, some films get rewatched with new eyes and become less of a favorite for many reasons. These days, I still love the film, but not as much as I did back in the day. I've aged, I've learned a lot, and I've seen a ton more films, giving me a different perspective on this one. So the 7 out of 10 is my newer rating for it, and it comes from many things. The main thing that still hits right in The Crow City of Angels is the look of the film. Yes, some of it looks like it's a set, and some of it looks like maquettes, but it looks right. It may not sound right to some, but the mix of sets, maquettes, and locations with the lighting and smoke in some scenes is just beautiful. Well, it's better than pushing ink in Detroit. This film has a lot, a clear aesthetic, something that many films don't seem to bother with anymore. The story is set in a specific universe and the attention to detail by the production team, the decor, set dressing, and selection of locations shows that there was a clear direction on what was wanted here and how to obtain it. Yes, it looks like a set often, but it works for the material at hand. This is a comic book film after all, and not all comic books are happy, brightly colored worlds for superheroes to live in. Sometimes, just sometimes, the universe the story is set in is dark, only at night, and violent on every front. This here works. The look of the film, its mood, its very goth universe. All of this is shot beautifully well by cinematographer Jean-Yves Escoffier, better known for his work on The Lovers on the Bridge. His work here is strong and gives the settings and story the space to develop on screen. Another aspect that has aged quite well is the music, from the score by Graham Ravel to the soundtrack filled with just the right songs. Ravel returns from the first film and gives this film a mood filled with emotions as he did for the first film. His work is a highlight of this film, something that is easy to go back to and listen to when in the right frame of mind for it. The soundtrack, on the other hand, is much heavier and even moodier. The Gold Dust Woman cover by Hole is fantastic here and stuck to me back in the day, still randomly requesting to put it on by way of earworm here and there. The soundtrack as a whole works on its own and with the film, staying as a regular CD to put on for some moody music that hints just right. Having songs by Filter, PJ Harvey, Bush, and even Rob Zombie, who almost directed his own Crow film back in the day, all helped to make this an enjoyable one. It should inspire trust, right? I mean, come on, we can't kill off all the mother <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, hey, hey, whoa, there'd be no one left to buy this shit. <laughs> now to where things get uneven, the performances. The cast here is interesting in the very least. The lead of Ash Corvin is actor Vincent Perez, who was rumored to have done his lines phonetically as his English was not on point or even possibly non-existent. This is far from this man's best work, something of frustration for someone like me who grew up watching him, kept watching him after, and even met the man. His work is usually much stronger than this. His work in Queen Margot, Fan Fan, Cyrano de Bergerac. You took my son's life. Some people are just born victims. Before the Crow, City of Angels shows that he can handle complex characters, action sequences, and so much more. His work since City of Angels shows that he just keeps getting better with parts in On Guard, The Libertine, a completely different fan fan, as well as a bunch of English language films shows that he can act and he can pull off just about any character. But something in this film is missing, leading to the belief that the rumored phonetic line readings is on point. Do you want me? Baby. Working alongside him in many scenes and getting plenty of scenes on her own is Mia Kirshner as Sarah, the only character coming back from the first film. Well, the only one besides the cat Gabriel. Her version of Sarah is quite far from what we see in the first film, but it's easy to just go with it as she is clearly an adult now with a career as a tattoo artist and a fascination for the dead. I had a dream about you. I saw them shoot you and your son. Her evolution makes some sense. The change in cast from this part between the two films, from Rochelle Davis to Mia Kirshner, is logical in that there is only two years between the first two films' releases. Yet, Sarah is now fully grown, thus setting the second film many years after the first. 
Kirshner takes this part, makes it hers, and brings an ethereal aura to the character that works great for this viewer. Her work here is something that still sells the film to me. I know plenty of people don't like what she did here, but I do. I know. Joining Perez and Kirshner on the other side of things are the rest of the cast members, including Richard Brooks, who sometimes hits just the right notes, but at the other times reminds us all that his character is no top dollar, and his performance is nowhere near that of Michael Wincott. This leads to a fairly non-menacing villain, with too many things in common with the first film's villain, while also not coming off like the leading man of evil that top dollar is. Of course, comparing the two is not fair, but as this is a sequel, it must be expected. Go to hell! Already been there, and I must confess, I like what I saw. <clears throat> Also, giving a frustratingly uneven performance is basically everyone else in the cast. Iggy Pop being an exception as his performance feels like it's somehow exactly what the movie needed. Considering he's not an actor and the others are, it's frustrating. The fact that Iggy Pop beats out most of the cast in terms of performance either says something about him or about them, or most likely a mix of three. You think I'm afraid of you? You fake! You think I'm afraid? You think I'm afraid? Pop clearly wanted to perform well and show what he could do while the rest of the supporting cast seems to be phoning it in for most of their performances. Granted, some of them were not exactly given much to do or are fully fleshed characters, which comes down to the writing and directing. Do you know how to fight? Do you know how to die? Of course, this film is based on the work by James O'Barr, but the script itself is David S. Goyer. For those who are used to his films, he has many ups and many downs. His work is a definition of an uneven career, while massive budgets put on some films were just not it. His work before The Crow is basic writing of mostly sequels and home video releases. Then The Crow City of Angels, then a few movies some may have heard of like Dark City, Blade, Blade 2, Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, which were all great, but also some massive letdowns like Blade Trinity, Jumper, The Unborn, Batman vs Superman, Dawn of Justice. Why did you say that name? The man writes a ton, and while well, not all of it ends up being good movies, is this something due to his writing, the directors working from his scripts, or production? Well, it's mostly a mix of all three, and to be honest, it makes seeing his name on a film an iffy thing to whether or not it'll be good. When you go into it, is there that fear that you might be creating something that tanks? Is that sure. always in the back of your mind? Sure, I mean, yeah, but you, you have to try to not think about it. Which may explain some of the things that didn't work with The Crow City of Angels. I'm sure some of the things were forced upon him by the studio, but also some of the writing is not great here and it shows on screen. Which leads us to the director. Hey, back off! Get the f*** away from me! For this sequel, the director chosen was Tim Pope a man better known for directing music videos. And by that, I mean pretty much just music videos. This may explain some of the decisions, some of the directions given to the actors, and a bit of how the film looks. He directed it and was excellent at it. Music videos for Susie Sue and the Banshees, The Cure, Psychedelic Furs, and Iggy Pop, for example. You can't stand here all day dreaming about heroin and Ziggy Pop. It's Iggy Pop. Whatever. His work was visually exactly what the film needed. His experience with actors was, however, limited, and I strongly believe this shows in the final product. One crow, sorrow, two crows, die! Overall, The Crow City of Angels hasn't aged well as its predecessor, and it loses in appeal as the years go by. Not mentioned above is the CGI, which ages even worse as time goes by. Basically, The Crow City of Angels is loved by some, but the love is very much based in nostalgia, with some being for the look of the film. Visually, it's a stunning film. The soundtrack rules, but the acting and CGI are not on point and they hurt the film as a whole. Sometimes a crow shows them the way, because sometimes love is stronger than death. <laughs>